I'm going to do my official welcome in a second, but I just got to say, I don't think Ms. Cattrall's class is going to have any energy for questions after that epic dance party in the background. That was pretty amazing. Um, my name is Jesse. Welcome to another exciting program with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And as you all know, we are doing our entire month dedicated solely to incredible women in science and exploration around the globe. This is classically our biggest month. It classically has the biggest attendance. And there's no surprise today that we have an audience from all across North America. So thank you so much for continuing to join us as we showcase and celebrate such amazing people and places around the globe. Now, um, I'm excited today because we are bringing back one of my favorite speakers we've had on in the last year, and that is Justine Hudson. She is a marine mammal biologist who's had the chance to do some really unique experiences in the field, which she will share with us today. And I want to note too, I said this before the broadcast got underway, but for the benefit of our folks on YouTube, this is like our second of, I think, five or six programs featuring whales and particularly Arctic whales in the next little bit. We just wrapped up with polar bears earlier this week as well. So if you want like an Arctic extravaganza, there's a lot of great stuff on the go. You can check all that out on our YouTube channel. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna stop talking, turn it over to Justine to blow your mind with all the cool stuff she gets up to. And so without further ado, Justine, welcome back to the broadcast. Nice to have you again. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat to you all today. Yeah, well, I know you've got a lot to share with us. Your presentation is up. You are good to go. And let's dive in literally and figuratively. <laughs> awesome. So hi, everyone. My name is Justine Hudson, and I am a marine biologist that works for Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So it's a federal government department. And today I'm going to be talking to you about what it's like to be a marine biologist and some of the work that we get to do. So I study marine mammals in the Canadian Arctic. So here's a map of the Arctic just to orient everyone. I know that we have people from all over today. So just to show everyone, this is Canada here um, in green. And then we have Alaska in the United States. We have Greenland here, Europe and Russia. So anything in this blue dotted line is considered the Arctic. It's in the Arctic Circle. So I study mammals that live in this area, but I also study mammals that live in the subarctic, which would be anywhere that's a little bit further south than the Arctic Circle. So particularly in Hudson Bay, I study um, belugas there. And I study a variety of different species. So we, I study belugas, which are this top whale here. I study bowhead whales, which are in the middle, and then I study narwhals as well. I also study ring seals killer whales and walrus. And just a little note, killer whales aren't technically an Arctic marine mammal, but they do travel to the Arctic in the summertime to feed on seals and whales. So even though they're not considered an Arctic whale, they do spend time in the Arctic. So part of my job as a marine biologist is studying marine mammals and making sure that they're healthy so that we can protect and conserve their populations. So some of the things that we need to know about marine mammals in order to protect them are things like where do they live? So where in the Arctic do whales and seals live? Does that change throughout the year depending on the season? Do they migrate from one area to the other? We also need to know how many animals are in a population. So for example, if we were studying a group of whales and we notice that year after year after year that their population numbers, so the number of whales in the population, if they were going up over time, we would say that that's a healthy population because their numbers are increasing. But if we notice that the numbers of whales in that population are going down, we would think that something's maybe wrong with the population and we would do further studies to investigate what's causing that decline in the population. We also need to know things like what do marine mammals eat because we, we all need to eat to survive. So knowing what they eat and how that changes over time is really important in studying marine mammals. We also need to know are, are these animals healthy? So are they, do they look good? Are they in good body condition? Are they sick? If they are sick, we need to know what's making them sick. So once again, we can do a better job at protecting and conserving their, um, their species and their population. We also need to know things like, is their environment safe? Are there different aspects of their environment like shipping or plastic contamination that's making the population sick? Knowing these, these things also makes it easier to protect um, the populations. So to do this, we get to go to some really cool places in the Arctic. And this is an example of what one of our field camps look like. So we go to these sometimes very remote places in the Arctic and we just set up camp on the shore like you have here. We sleep in these yellow tents. We have a kitchen tent like this white and orange one here. 
And then we would boat out. There's a little boat here and a little boat there. We would boat out to different areas wherever we're studying or whatever we're studying and come back to camp at night. I'm always asked what do camps look like. So I like to start off with a photo like this. And there are a number of different ways that you can study marine mammals or any animal to, to be honest. So one of the ways that we study how many animals are in a population is by flying drones. So here's a drone video of us flying um, over a group of whales in a place called Churchill, Manitoba. It's known as the polar bear capital of the world, but it's also the beluga capital. There's tons of whales that come to this estuary every year. So this is, um, as you can see, a group of whales. There's tons of them that come here. And by flying drones, we can study their population. So what we normally do is we would fly the drone over groups of whales and take photos of them. And we would look for whales that have unique distinguishing marks on them. And then by doing this for multiple years in a row, we can see if we're seeing the same individuals year after year after year. And then we do some very complicated math to get a sense of how many whales are in the population. And this is an example of a whale that we've seen multiple years in a row. So you can see that it has this really unique mark here. It almost looks like a video game controller to me. And it was spotted for the first time um, for us that we've seen it in 2017. And then we saw it again in 2018. And I think it's actually been seen two years after this as well. So not only do we know that this whale has survived for the last four years, which is great, but we also know that it's coming back to the same area year after year after year, which is really important because we're finding out where the animal is um, traveling to and where it's um, and where it is in the summertime. We also know that uh, you can't see it in this photo, but this whale has been traveling with the same group of whales year after year after year. So it's traveling with its own little social group that it's made and um, they're all coming back to the same um, area year after year. And like I said, based on these photos and some complicated math, we can figure out how many whales are in the population. We can also figure out how healthy whales are. So in general, a skinny whale is considered to have poor body condition, and it means that it's on the unhealthy side. So there might be something wrong with the whale. And fat whales are considered to be in good body condition, and they're probably a little bit more healthy. So this is an example of um, some work that we did this summer in a place called Igloolik in Nunavut. And this is a bowhead whale that is very round. So we would say that this whale is in good body condition. To find out how many animals are in a population, we also fly in aerial surveys. So what that means is that we get into these very tiny planes and we'll fly over different areas of the Arctic and we will count animals from the airplane. So here are two of my colleagues who were doing a narwhal survey. So they were flying over to count narwhal. Um, so they were in the little plane, but we also have cameras on the underside of the plane that can take photographs at the same time. So we can compare the number of animals seen or counted by people in the plane to the number of animals seen in photographs. And this is an example of what one of the photographs looks like. So as you can see in this photo here, we have two narwhal. Um, and based on this photo, you can tell that these two narwhal are adults because they are white in color. So when belugas and narwhals are little or when they're born, they are gray in color. And as they get older, they turn white. Kind of like, you know, when you get older, older people have gray hair, kind of the same thing. You know, they get a little bit whiter as they get older. And so we can tell that these are two adults. Additionally, we can tell that these are likely male narwhals because they, if you look really closely, they have tusks. Both of them have really long tusks. And in general, male narwhals are the ones that have tusks, whereas female narwhals sometimes have tusks, but it's not as common. So these are two adult nar male narwhal. In this photo, we can see that we have one adult, which is right here because it's white in color. And then right next to it, there's a little calf. And you can tell because it's smaller in size, but also darker in color. So this, these two whales here are likely to be a mother calf pair. We know that it's female because it doesn't have a tusk. Then you have these two narwhal here that are a little bit bigger than this calf here, but they're still dark. So we would say that these are two juveniles. So just based on this photo, we know that we have an adult female with a calf and they're, they are accompanied by two juveniles. So just on these photos, we can get a lot of information. 
Just gonna take a sip of water here. So we don't just fly surveys to count whales, we also fly surveys to count seals. But as you can see, based on this photo, it's not as easy to see a seal on ice as it is to see a narwhal or a beluga in water. So if you're flying in an airplane, you might fly over this group of seals here and think, oh, that just looks like dirt or rocks or maybe an animal's poop. It doesn't, you can't really make out what they are. And it makes it really difficult to count seals from aerial surveys. So what we've done is equipped our airplanes with something called a thermal image. So thermal images essentially take photos of heat. So anything that's warm blooded like humans or animals will show up on the photos as yellow or orange blobs in the photo. So this is the exact same photo that I just sent or that I just showed you. And then this is the photos on top of each other. So you can see that all of these orange and yellow spots are showing that there are um, animals on the ice. So Based on this photo, I would say that there's around six seals. Not sure, it's still, it's still a little tricky to, to see the seals from airplanes, but you get a sense of how many there are at least. And you know that they're not rocks, which is also important. And then the a new way that we've been counting whales is actually from space. So there's a bunch of satellites flying around in space right now, and some of them take pictures. And this is my party trick, so don't do it right now, but if you have an iPad or an iPhone, if you go to your Maps application on your phone and you look up a place called Cunningham Inlet and you zoom in, this is what you'll see. Those are beluga whales. So you can see beluga whales from space, which is so cool. So as you can see, it's not as clear as the aerial photos or the drone photos, but you still can get a sense for how many whales are in a location. And you can also figure out where different whales are because we can't fly everywhere in the Arctic. We're only flying for maybe three weeks of the year. So it's we're not able to cover a huge area over a long period of time, but satellites are always in space. So we can take photos at any time as long as there's no cloud cover and get an image that looks like this which I think is pretty cool. So we also collect different samples from marine mammals so that we can see how healthy they are. So this is a video of my friend Karen and I <laughs> collecting beluga snot samples. So just for anyone that doesn't know, a beluga's nose is essentially its blowhole. So when the whale comes to the surface to breathe, it exhales and blows out a bunch of snot. And then we use this long stick with a pole or this long pole with a Petri dish on the end of it to collect that snot sample. We can then go back to the lab and do a bunch of different um, analyses on that snot sample to find out how stressed the whales are or um, the different type of bacteria that are in their snot to see how healthy they are. There's a lot of information that we can gain by collecting snot samples. Poop is also another great sample to collect from marine mammals. So this is a bunch of whale poop. I think this is blue whale poop um, floating in the water. You can go out and collect this poop with a net and it can tell you a lot about the animal that you collected it from. So you can do genetics, which will tell you what sex the animal is. So if it's male or female, you can also use um, the poop sample to figure out what the animal has been eating. So you can go through and like, investigate what types of critters are in the poop to figure out what the animal's been eating. And you can also do different analyses like um, hormone analysis to figure out if the animal is pregnant or stressed. So poop is another great sample type to collect. And then one of the ways that we try to figure out where animals are and where they migrate to is by tagging them. So there are a bunch of different tags that you can use and tags are essentially these little things, these little devices, similar to this one, that you put on the whale and depending on what type of tag it is, it'll last anywhere from a day to years and it'll tell you exactly where the whale travels to. So this is a video that we took this summer of us tagging bowhead whales. We actually don't tag the whale in this video. Um, we were not successful with this whale, but I just thought it was a really cool video to show when we're to tag a whale. 
So you can see the bowhead is just under the boat right now. And the tag is this orange um, thing on the end of the pole. And this is a suction cup tag. So essentially what you would do is you would kind of hit the tag onto the whale and it gets suction cupped on. So kind of like the suction cups that you have in your shower, similar idea. And yeah, and then it would tell us where the whale travels to. Some of them even record noises so you can see um, or you can hear what the whale is hearing in different areas. There's a lot of really cool information that you can get from tags. And then this is, so this summer we were in a place called Aglulik to do this work and we tagged, I can't remember how many whales we did, but this is a little map um, showing you where all of the whales that we tagged, where they went over the last eight months. And you can see the date on the top here. So you can see they traveled quite a bit. We tagged them in this up, upper corner and they went all the way over here and then all the way back down here. And this, uh, this last map was made February 2nd. So that was two weeks ago. So as of two weeks ago, all the whales are in Davis Strait here. And with that note, I am done and I'm really excited to answer any questions that you might have. Oh, Justine, what an extraordinary presentation. Such cool science and also some of the best pictures we've ever seen in this <laughs> broadcast of Arctic stuff going on. What a man. The, the two of the, the two boats on like the ice shelf where you're like looking out, you've got the boats there and there's the whale coming up to you. Oh, what a spectacular image. Um, if you want to come out of screen share, if you can't, I don't know if you can see us with your setup right now, but feel free to do that so you can have a bit of a conversation with us. YouTubers, please feel free to share your questions in the chat. We'd love to have you join in there. And we've got our three live classes with us, so I am going to start by heading to Carter in Mr. Shadow's class because he's like right up at the camera and he's ready, Justine. He is so ready. And you should be good now. Awesome. Yes. Perfect. Yes, cool. <laughs> Let's head to Chalk River 678. Hey, hey. 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 Hi. Um, how long have you been interested in whales? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I know this is not very common when you talk to someone who's a marine biologist because a lot of people grow up wanting to be marine biologists, but, but I actually had no idea what I wanted to be for a very long time. So I would say that I've been interested in whales for maybe maybe the last like 10 years. Yeah, but this is yeah. good. Like I, as you said, we have a lot of people that come on this broadcast and they're like, I was four years old and I saw a whale and it was my whole life. And like, that is great. That's a fantastic story. But to be someone who started off, whether it's high school, university, and it was like, I don't have the foggiest clue. And you end up in something where it becomes a passion going along. I think it's really heartening because I remember in school, I was one of those lucky people that like, I knew what I wanted to do from when I was five, but almost no one else is like that. I was in third year university. Most people are like, I don't even know what field I want to be in, like much less specific details. And I think so that's that's fantastic to hear. Yeah. Um, great question, guys, to kick us off. I'm going to head to Second Street, Mr. Falconer's class, in just a second. If you guys want to come up and unmute your mic while you're doing that. Oh, they were really fast. I don't need to do anything else. They're, they're quick on the mic. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi. What is the scientific name for a beluga whale? Ooh, no pressure on the fly. <laughs> Delphinapterus lucas. So, do you have a favorite Latin name too? Like, do you is it? Do you just know the ones specifically that you work with, or are you like a tremendous nerd like me? Oh, I'm not a tremendous nerd. I oh. only know the ones that I know. <laughs> For our students, I can give you a really easy one. It's not a whale, but the gorilla's Latin name is gorilla gorilla, which is really helpful. Oh, so just, you're you're already really there. Easy. I wish they were all that there. easy. <laughs> Uh, we're going to head to Baldwinville, New York, Miss Cottrell's grade fifth, uh, fifth graders. Come on in, guys, and take us away. Hey. What is the most aggressive animal you have been around, and how did you react? Ooh, aggressive. the most aggressive animal. Aggressive. Oh, that's a great question. Aggressive. Luckily, whales aren't very aggressive, so, or in my experience, they haven't been. Um, oh, my goodness. I'm trying to think of an aggressive animal that I've been around. Can I don't know. The shore maybe? Like, is there any, do you have, have you ever felt in danger from any animal that you've been near or working with? No. No, never. Yep. And I'm really glad that this is your answer. And I'm glad we got this question. This is something, I mean, we have a lot of people on here that are shark researchers, tigers, you know, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. 
And like, if you respect animals, if you give them that space, you're unlikely to ever end up in a situation where you are in danger. I've actually, I'm trying to think if anyone's ever mentioned an aggressive animal in any of the yeah. programs. Like, animals want to be left alone. You know, they want, you know, sometimes they don't mind people if they're nearby, but they're not usually coming for you in any mean way. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Speaking of space, I love this question from our friends in BC. So the question on YouTube is, uh, does Canada, doesn't Canada have a law about using your boat motor close to whales? It looks like in the snot collection video that you're really close and that the boat's moving. Uh, is that not dangerous? How do you avoid hitting the whales? What's going on? Yeah, that's a great question. So we do have laws about how close you're able to get to whales. So if you were, you know, just going on the water, you have your own boat, there are rules of how far you have to be from whales, depending on the species and what area you're in, there's different distances that you have to stay. But because we're doing research, we get per special permission. So we um, send in permits and tell, um, you know, the permitting office, what we're doing, where we're doing it. And we're able to get a little bit closer to the whales, but we still try to stay, um, give them a little bit of distance. We try to keep our research, you know, far away because it, it can alter the behavior of the animals that you're studying. And in a lot of cases, we want them to be in their natural state. We don't want to disturb them. Yep. So for anyone who's just out boating for recreation, yes, you have to stay a specific distance away. But when you're doing science, you do, um, you know, you send in a, a permit and you get permission to be that close to whales. Churchill, in particular, in that snot collecting video, is really unique because the whales come up to you. So our boat was stopped there. We go out to areas where we see whales, but we'll still keep our distance, but they would actually come up to us because we actually don't know why they do it. So we think that they like to kind of play in the wash of the boat, kind of like dolphins do. If you've ever seen dolphins in like Florida, they kind of ride the waves behind the boat. We don't know if that's what they're doing or if they're just really curious, but Churchill is one of those places where whales do come up to you and it's a very unique situation. I'm so glad you mentioned this and I want to follow up because I've had the chance to do this. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever had the chance to do in nature in my life. And the coolest thing about it is you're in the boat, the whales come up, you can hear them through the water. Like you don't even need the hydrophone. You just, it resonates through the boat and you hear the whale call, which is like, you know this. It's like one of the coolest things in the world ever. Like it's so yeah. amazing. It is. Uh, Great question, guys. All right. By the way, we're getting some great YouTube queries coming in. I'm going to head back to our live classes at least one more time. We were like whipping through these with Justine. And Justine, thank you for being the shortest presentation in so long. So we have all this time for q and A. I appreciate you. No um, Ms. Almeida's class joining us uh, in Toronto. And I want to note, Ms. Almeida, you can follow up with us about this question because I can get you even more resources on this. But what courses do you need to take in high school? Do you have an interest in being a marine biologist? That is a great question. So I would say, oh, I mean, they're probably all going to be important. So of course, you'd want to take biology because, you know, it's a biology that you would be doing. Chemistry is really important. I am actually surprised how much chemistry that I do as a marine biologist. A lot of the different lab analyses that I do involve chemistry in some capacity. So taking chemistry, also a great option. Sorry. Um, and then English. I know everyone's probably going to be like, why English? But as marine biologists or a biologist in general, we do a lot of writing. So getting your English you know, classes and doing well in those classes is also really important to be a biologist because we do we communicate through writing a lot as biologists. So it's important to to have that as well. Yeah. Great answer. Oh, I would also uh, sorry. I would also say math like yes. any math. It's important. We do a lot of math as biologists too. I know. I know. I know. I know. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> to my knowledge, for most of the marine biology programs in Ontario where this class is asking from, you need English, math, chem, and biology to get into those programs in university anyway. So just following up with that, continuing with that. And you're very lucky because Canada has some of the best marine biology schools in the world. I mean, in Ontario, Guelph led to a lot of the marine biology people doing great stuff around the country. Winnipeg, where Justine, I mean, like Winnipeg, for some reason, is the marine mammal hub. It seems right in the middle of the continent. They decided to go as far from the oceans as humanly possible. They're like, that's where we'll put the whale. <laughs> uh, but uh, a really, really great question. So thank you for that, guys. Um, oh, and just a quick follow up on this. Geography courses, if they exist. Yes, we can both agree. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The more you know about the world, the better equipped exactly. you are to 
Just study and answer. Yeah. Um, let's head back to Mr. Shadow's class. We'll do another round. We'll take some from YouTube as we go along. Again, lots of time here, folks. Here, folks. Mr. Shadow, come, come on back in. Come on back in. How do you know that when you're counting whales, there's not a lot more underwater that you just can't see? Good question. That is a great question. So we, depending on the, so when we're doing surveys and we get our numbers, we put that number into a very complicated math equation that actually takes into account the number of animals that we assume is below the surface. So depending on where you are and what species it is, there'll be a number, I think it's generally half. So we are we think that there's half the animals at the surface and half of them would be under the surface and we can't see them. So that all gets taken into account when we do our fancy math calculations. Fascinating. Um, you mentioned something else too early in the program, and I just remembered it, and I want to ask you. So the whiteness as they get older, do they keep getting whiter as they get older? Or is it just like a juvenile? Ad okay, it's not like yeah, yeah. Like they're eighty. <laughs> they don't go see through after a while. No, <laughs> they get yeah. They, once they're an um, adult and they're white, they just kind of stay to that white color, and then yeah. Yeah. Do they keep growing as they? age or do they stop okay they get to well, they're very age. much like us you know we get to a certain size and then we stop growing okay great thanks <laughs> um second street come on back in mr falconer's crew and take us away <laughs> hi and uh when you hear beluga whales what do they sound like and do you learn anything from what they sound like yeah that's another great question so i didn't add any sounds to um, the video today because I don't really work with acoustics or the sounds that the whales make, but they definitely make sounds. I can't, I can't do an impression of a beluga, unfortunately, but they sound, they sound like squeaky. They also make noises that sound like, um, like a door squeaking. They make a lot of chirps and like their echolocation sounds like Oh, I wish I had it. I Here, should have. I've got a video. I've okay, seen this perfect. Talking, but I, I want to say that you absolutely could have tried to do the sound, and next time we'll try <laughs> and get you to do that. Um, here we go. This is uh, from Cunningham, England, I'm pretty sure, is where they said this when I was pulling it up. So let's hear some of the calls of the blue guy. Here, in Canada's Arctic, their songs have long earned them the nickname Canaries of the Sea. Do you hear but this until over the top. Little was actually known about the purpose of their chirps, squeaks, and whistles. So we won't play the full thing, but you get a light sense of it, and I can absolutely link that into the chat for everybody too, okay? So everyone will have the, the beluga call. I um for people that are interested in acoustics, by the way, we just did a program recently and we've had a one of the best marine bioacousticians from Vancouver Island named Bill Halliday comes on all the time. So some really, really cool stuff if you want to follow up with sounds and the things we can learn from them. Great question, guys. Um, Miss Catrells, Baldensville, come on back. Take us away. Hey. Uh, I was wondering, uh, can you see the whale's poop looking in the water without a machine? Can you see their poop looking in the water? Yeah. Yeah, without a, without a machine, without any, yeah. Yeah, you can. So a lot of the times it just floats on the surface. So you'll just see kind of like they'll swim under and then all of this orange brown poop will kind of float at the surface for a bit. So you just take a net and then you scoop it all up. So you definitely can see it without any machines. One of the things I love from your talk, um, and it's funny because I hadn't linked it to you for whatever reason, the Cunningham Inlet thing really stuck with me from the first time you did that. Like I shared that with everyone for like a month <laughs> after that. I was like obsessed, like Google Earth, look what you can do. But as you're flying into Churchill, you can see the whales from the plane. Like they're yeah. so white and you're like, oh my gosh. And there's hundreds of whales in the water and it's just, huh, lucky you. And Churchill is so milky colored too. Like the clarity, and I mean, I guess depends on when you go, but it's not as clear as Cunningham Inlet. So the fact that you can see them from space and or from airplanes in Churchill is really cool too. It's all cool. Justine, you have a lucky job and you're <laughs> helpful in all this. Um, let's take a few more from YouTube. Uh, Miss Ward's class wants to know, what's your favorite animal you've encountered? No pressure. Ooh, that's tough. Mm -hmm. I saw my first bowhead whale in person last summer and i will have to say that that was probably my favorite encounter or like the whole field season was my favorite so i would i would say bowhead whales okay they're a they're a special creature they're if people haven't i mean we got a chance to see a little bit today but check out bowhead whales and you're done they are a beautiful beautiful animal um back to bc does the narwhal's tooth stop growing or does it just keep forever and ever what's the deal that's a great question. I'm actually not sure if it, I imagine it stops at a certain point. I don't imagine, actually, sorry, I do know that it does stop at a certain point because we actually 
use the tusk to age the animal. So we'll take a tusk and we'll slice it in half so that we can see the inside of it. And inside there's all of these lines. So kind of like a tree ring and you can actually age the animal based on the number of lines in the tusk. And as the animal gets older, those lines kind of compress on each other and get smaller and smaller because the tusk has reached its full length. So yeah, it does stop, but it does get really long before it gets there. <laughs> this is something that I, for whatever reason, I'm really enamored with whenever you can age something. So tree rings is the most familiar to classes. You can do this with coral reefs. They've got growth rings, fish ear bones, <laughs> otoliths or something that we featured a lot of broadcasts before. I didn't know about the tusk, but like that's, that didn't need to be the case. Like it's just such a fluky thing in nature that there's so many ways that we can age living things and dead things. It's just fantastic. Anyway, great exactly. question. Exactly. Um, let's head back to Mr. Shannon. This is like the fastest Q&A we've ever had. <laughs> I love uh, it. Mr. Shannon, Mr. come on in. Come Take on it away. Take it away. Hi. 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 What's the scientific term for walruses? Oh, name for walruses. Okay. I think I know this. Is gonna... it monoceris monodon or opposite monodon monoceris? I think you're going to have to, okay. you're going to have to Mono... call a friend on that. I've got something quite different, actually, which is interesting. I'm trying. I, I've heard what you're talking about before. I've got Odobenus rosmaris is walrus. This oh, is, sorry. This did you say it. walrus or narwhal? Yes. Uh, oh, I think they said walrus, but narwhal. Here. Oh, both. Okay, oh, both. Well, okay, well then we got then. this together, Jesse. <laughs> you got it for narwhal, though. So yes, narwhal Latin name is let's see. Da, 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 da. Monodon monoceros, which literally means what? One tooth, one ceros? Yeah. What's ceros? Why am I missing that? Just like one Is tooth, it... one tooth? Ceros? Not. Maybe that's another class you guys can take, Latin. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we're getting into the week. I've never had two Latin name questions in 1300 broadcasts, so thank you for that, Skip. <laughs> um, keep on here. Just like, get her out all. <laughs> Second Street, come on back, Mr. Falconer Screwman. Come on in. Hey. Um, how did the beluga whale come to be? How did it come to what? Be, like, how, how was it, like, when was it discovered? Oh, when was it found? How did it evolve? Anything like that, Justine? Oh, I, I don't know that one. I don't know that one. I'm not sure when it, I mean, people have been living in the Arctic for a really long time, so I don't know how far back it was discovered. Time of, no, and that's a good answer. So I mean, people like anyone who came across on the land bridge over Asia to get to North America, which by the way is how people got to North America, which is super cool back in the day. Um, Arctic people would have found beluga. They would have found narwhals. They would have seen these creatures. That actually would have been some of the first people to come to North and South America would have interacted with those animals. And that is at least, I think 15,000, 20,000 years ago as we put the timeline on that, that tends to shift. Um, but it's a really neat question. Is there a closest relative of belugas? Is it narwhals? Is it like, do you know some of the phylogeny, so to speak? Yeah, so belugas and narwhal are very closely related. They are cousins, you could say. So yeah, they're the, uh, yeah, they're very closely related. So we got this question with the whale thing the other day and, and um, belugas are the classic example. I mean, in Finding Nemo 2, we've got like the melon to project sounds going along. Do narwhals have anything like that or not? Yep. Okay. Yeah, they do. So they also use their melon to communicate or like to receive sound. So yeah, very similar. And you actually see, I don't know if anyone's talked about the um, the narwhal that's been seen with the belugas in the St. Lawrence with you guys, but there's been an, a narwhal that for some reason made its, down, its way down to the St. Lawrence that's been hanging out with a group of belugas there. And it's been with them for years now. So that's really cool. And there's also beluga and narwhal are so closely related that there's um, been a skull that was found, I can't remember how many years ago, that we've discovered is a narluga. So what? it is a mix between a beluga and a narwhal, um, which is pretty cool. So that's how closely related they are, that they can mate with one another. And we've so we've never seen this in the wild. We found a skull that they were able to be like, there's enough of features of each that this is... Yeah, and I they did genetics that. on it as well. So it's Weird. like been genetically confirmed, yeah. It's a very weird looking skull as well. So it's it doesn't look like either a narwhal or a beluga. I've I've never heard of an identification of a mixed breeding thing based on a fossil or bone before. That's really cool to hear. Very cool. 
Great. Yeah. Cool. Um, Miss Cottrell's class, come on back in. We're time's flying, so folks, we're almost done <laughs> uh, the program, but I'll bring you in for one more question. We might take a couple more, and uh, we'll wrap up after that. Hey, fifth graders. Hi there. Um, I was wondering, like, are there tags, well, are there cameras on any of the tags? And if not, would it be a good idea? Because it would be pretty cool to be yeah, seen. Like a critter yeah. cam. That is a great question. And I think it would be pretty cool too. We haven't done any tags like on in our research program that have cameras on them as far as I know, but other whale researchers have. And I've seen some of the videos that they've collected and it is amazing. You get to, the tag is on the back of the whale and you can see it swimming around and then opening its mouth when it's eating. And then you get to hear everything and just like see the environment that it's in. It, it is really cool when you put cameras on whales. I've just put in the chat for everybody and on YouTube, uh, the critter cam footage of a humpback whale from National Geographic, an article. So if you want to check out that. I, it's funny, actually, I remember, I would say 10 years ago, there was tons of critter cam stuff with all over the news and it's sort of died in the vine. I don't know whether it just doesn't make the news anymore or if it's just happening a little bit less, but it's fascinating science. I think so uh, too. Justine, uh, this has been such a pleasure today. Uh, so nice to get your insights, the amazing footage at the beginning, uh, all the pictures and, and stories that you had the chance to share with us. Is there a place or a species that you're particularly keen to study that you haven't had the chance to yet? Like, where would you go, pie in the sky? You're invited on the most epic research expedition ever. What would you do? Oh, that is an amazing question. Um, I would love to go to the South Pole. So go to Antarctica and see some of the whales there. I would not be picky on any of the species that I got to see. Um, just going there and seeing as many marine mammals as possible would definitely be a dream. Okay, well, I certainly hope you get that chance. I know from experience, a lot of marine biologists we've had on this program have done hopping over the pole. So yeah. uh, it's, it's a very high likelihood of getting that chance in the years to come. <laughs> Um, is there a final message you have for our kids today? Anything you'd like them to take home with about belugas, about marine biology in general? What can we, we leave them with to inspire them a little bit further before we wrap up? Oh, I, this is always such a tough question. I would just say if you are interested in marine biology, just go out and, you know, study what's around you. Because, of course, when you're a kid, you know, especially if you're in landlocked places like Winnipeg, like I am, getting to the ocean is a little bit difficult. But there's so much nature around you. So go out and enjoy the nature that you can see and experience in your, you know, close vicinity um, and just chase your dreams, I guess, you know, you'll be able to do it. <laughs> Fantastic. I encourage always tell classes when we get someone who shares a message like that, check out iNaturalist. You can use it to find out wildlife anywhere in the globe. You can type in any city, any area, see what lives there. You can check out your own neck of the woods. You can submit your own pictures and contribute to a global data set actually used by scientists. So it's a really useful tool. And if you ever get the chance to go whale watching, I mean, Justine's had some pretty unique and unbelievable experiences out in the water, but it really does, it changes you. It's one of the animals that really like is a profound experience to see a whale for the first time. So get to a coast, Canada, US, you guys have tons of whales on the coast. So lots of opportunity. <laughs> and uh, I really uh, appreciate all this. Justine, what we do to end every broadcast, as you might remember from our last time, I'm going to bring in our very enthusiastic classrooms today, say a big thank you and farewell. So Mr. Shattuck, Second Street, Mr. Falker, Mr. Mr. Charles Glass, thank you all so, so, so much. much. And have a wonderful day. Thank you.